Hey guys, so I wanted to do a quick review of everything uh, for PFT 106 because today is our final exam. Um, so this is sort of our day eight review here. Um, uh, we're gonna kind of go over everything that is sort of most important for you guys to remember uh, when it comes to your uh, final exam here. So uh, first thing we talked about when we kicked off this class, we talked about the difference between diagnosis-oriented exercise management and problem-oriented exercise management. Uh, diagnosis-oriented exercise management is uh, where you design a fitness program based solely on like a client's condition rather than basing that program on the individual themselves, right? So uh, you're sort of putting somebody into a box based on whatever disease or condition they might be dealing with um, rather than actually addressing like what are problems for this person. You know, um, for instance, like if you try to treat somebody uh, who might have like multiple sclerosis, you know, like that's a condition that we don't really have any uh, effect on when it comes to exercise other than, uh, you know, they have decreased balance and we can improve that person's balance, right? Um, so, you know, that's the difference between like working on like a disease versus like treating the problems, which is really our area of expertise. So problem-oriented exercise management is actually going to, you know, um, take into account your person's individual needs and abilities and wants, right? So uh, it uses subjective and objective information to determine the problems uh, and needs an individual has uh, in order to create a plan to address those in like an appropriate time frame. So really the big thing that we're looking for here is we're looking for like what you know, are issues that are maybe holding them back in their life that we can sort of address there. Um, and so, you know, uh, we are going to use a basic format for that. We're going to typically use uh, soap notes. You know, not everybody is going to use these in their career, but if you ever work in like a clinic where you're maybe like sharing clients, you want to make sure that you're documenting things very, very clearly so that it's easy for everyone to follow. And that's what your soap notes are for. So SOAP is an acronym. Uh, it's a documentation tool for writing clients programs. Uh, and it's an acronym that stands for uh, SOAP subjective, objective assessment, and plan. So the subjective portion is gather that's, uh, information that's uh, gathered about your client that you cannot necessarily like measure. Like this is important information, but you can't necessarily like slap a number on these things. You're not necessarily looking for, you know, um, you know, objective progress in your subjective information. You're just looking for information that can help you sort of determine like what your client's interests are, maybe what conditions or medications they're dealing with, um, and things like that. Your objective information is data that you can measure, right? So this is information uh, that is typically number-based, um, where you are measuring particularly, you know, what their BMI is, what their blood pressure is, right? And if those things improve over time, you can kind of use those numbers as benchmarks for improvement. So um, that's your gathering portion uh, when it comes to your soap notes. Now the assessment portion, uh, after you've sort of gathered some subjective and, and objective portions, you're gonna write down the relevant information or any other assessments that you think are appropriate for your client and relevant to their condition or their goals. Um, that's what you're going to do there. So for instance, like if you have a client who's dealing with osteoporosis, right? Um, that's a disease that often affects somebody's balance. So if you were to perform a, that's, uh, if you were to perform a balance assessment, you would want to write that down in the assessment section. You'd be like, hey, this is the type of assessment that we think is most appropriate for this person, right? Just like if you have a person who's dealing with like hypertension, um, you know, blood pressure assessments are really important there. So you're not always gonna go in order with your soap notes. A lot of times you're gonna kind of be pinging back and forth up and down the note. Um, you know, you might uh, sort of recall an assessment that's really important and you've already filled out some of the objective information, but then you're like, you know what, let's go back and perform this assessment as well. Um, so that is the SOA portion. And then lastly, you've got your plan. So once you've got all this data, you've got assessments picked out, you've got objective information and subjective information, now you can actually write a program based on that information that is tailored specifically to your client. You know? uh, so earlier we did, you know, we had a, an osteoporosis client, so they have low bone density and poor balance. So we wrote a plan that involves lots of balance exercises in order to improve that, right? Um, so. 
examples here of objective versus subjective information because sometimes that is something that some people struggle with. Objective information, uh, generally, again, very number-based, like blood pressure, heart rate, posture, weight, body fat percentage. These are all very number-based things, whereas um, subjective information, like their occupation, any injuries they might have, their hobbies, medical history, any medications they might be on, or even their habits, that's all subjective. You know, you cannot measure how much a medication is going to affect one person compared to another. You know, some people are more intensely responding uh, to certain things. So um, you can't necessarily label it, but it is important information to have. Um, now, when it comes to like prescribing, like if you look at the plan portion of your uh, SOAP notes, you know, you want to know how to like write a program very clearly for somebody. And so we're going to use a guideline for that called the FIT principles. It stands for frequency, intensity, time, type, and enjoyment. And they're basically um, five guidelines that as long as you're considering those five things, you're going to write a pretty effective program for somebody. So the frequency is going to be the number of sessions in a given time period. So for instance, uh, exercising five days a week. That's an example of, you know, considering the frequency. Um, intensity is the level of demand, you know. Uh, an example of that would be 65 to 75% of max heart rate max, or maybe you could say like a uh, 14 to 15 on the RPE scale, right? Both of those, mm -hmm. Both of those are examples of intensity, right? Um, you could also just base it on the talk test method and be like, you know, you should be able to hold a conversation this whole time. That's prescribing intensity. Um, generally, you know, my preferred method is like maximum heart rate, you know, um, basing it on like how someone's heart is performing during a routine, but if they don't have a heart rate monitor or, you know, that's just not practical for them um, to like continually check their pulse, uh, you know, the RPE method or the talk test are both really, really effective. We'll put the talk test up here as well. Um, and then we have the time, that's the length of time given in the activity. So 30 minutes of cardiovascular training would be an example of that. If they can't perform 30 minutes straight, maybe you could have them do three 10 minute sessions per day. All of those are examples of um, the time, right? Uh, the type is the actual mode of exercise. So for instance, like weight bearing exercises, if you have like a client who has osteoporosis, that's been shown to have really positive effects. Um, so walking and lifting weights are really good examples of that. But let's say you have a client with arthritis and maybe like gravity is an issue for them because that causes a lot of pressure on their joints. Swimming might be a really effective method uh, for them instead. So that's the mode or the type of activity. Uh, and then enjoyment is the level of pleasure derived from it, you know? Um, how fun or how engaging is the activity? Uh, that's the enjoyment factor, which honestly is one of the most important parts because you could write the world's greatest program, but if your client doesn't do it, it's not really gonna get them anywhere. Um, so next thing, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about all of the different conditions that we're gonna be uh, sort of going through in this course. Um, so we call simultaneous conditions that somebody's experienced, we call that a comorbidity. Um, it's basically anytime somebody is dealing with one or more conditions, right? So like if uh, a, an individual is obese and that's causing them to have high blood pressure and diabetes, uh, those are comorbidities, right? Um, so the special populations that we sort of went through in this course, we, we talked about youths, right? That's going to be age 6 to 20, um, with children being ages 2 to 11 and adolescents being about age 12 to 20, right? Um, so obviously we want kids to be active a lot more than a lot of our other populations. We're really trying to get them active like 60 minutes a day. You know, the general guidelines for activity are 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week or 75 minutes of high intensity activity per week or vigorous intensity activity per week. But with kids, we want them to get 60 minutes a day um, because really that's the, the best way to sort of create healthy habits that are gonna carry on into adulthood. Um, Seniors, another population that we talked a lot about, pe persons like 65 and older. However, uh, we're about to dive into our senior population class tomorrow, and we're going to talk about how like age is very much not you know um, based on just your numbers. You know, it's based on how you feel. Um, so that definition's, in my opinion, a little weak. But um, two common conditions that you're going to see among senior clients are going to be arteriosclerosis, which is a hardening or a loss of the elastic properties of your blood vessels or atherosclerosis, which is basically the buildup of plaque on the inside of your blood vessels, right? Um, that's sometimes referred to as like dyslipidemia as well, right? Um, basically altered cholesterol levels. Um, 
So senior populations, we know that we want to get them active, um, you know, uh, three to five days per week if possible. We want to make sure that they are also engaging in activity um, for maybe 20 to 40 minutes. If they can't necessarily um, be active that long, maybe you can get them to break that up into a few 10 minute sessions or a few 20 minute sessions per day. Um, but we do want uh, our seniors to keep moving. Uh, obesity is a care, uh, is the condition of subcutaneous fat exceeding your lean body mass, so excessive levels of adipose tissue. Um, that is characterized by a BMI of 30 or greater. So remember, we've got our body mass index, right? Um, if it is above 30, that is considered obesity, and we know that there's a lot of conditions and diseases and comorbidities associated with obesity, right? Um, so uh, normal body weight is going to be anywhere from 18.5 to 24.9, 25 to 29.9 is going to be considered overweight, and then obesity is going to be 30 or higher. Um, now a condition that is commonly associated with obesity is also going to be diabetes, uh, which is basically a condition in which an individual is experiencing impaired glucose control. So there's two types of this. Um, type two is the most common, although it is also the more preventable of the two. Um, type two diabetes is what we call insulin resistant diabetes or adult onset diabetes. Uh, and basically that is where the body has actually become resistant to its own insulin, right? Insulin job is to drive sugar out of your blood into your cells uh, and if your cells have become resistant and that insulin no longer has that effect well they're going to experience elevated blood sugar levels which causes a lot of problems inside the body um, type 1 diabetes is what we call insulin dependent diabetes uh, which is or sometimes known as like childhood diabetes and this is where basically a client might have like a bum pancreas that doesn't create as much insulin as it's supposed to. And so that often, both of these can result in hyperglycemia, although it's much more common in your type one diabetics. Um, and then actually I'm gonna put that under this way. And then your clients also might experience like hypoglycemia, like if they take too much insulin uh, or if their body just doesn't take enough time to produce insulin, their body is maybe resistant to it. And then all of a sudden, it just makes a ton of it um, in order to like really drive those blood sugar levels down. What ends up happening is your blood sugar levels drop below normal and then you end up with a severe lack of energy. That's gonna be hypoglycemia. So if you're hyper, you have lots of energy and if you're hypo, you have very little energy. Um, and so uh, that is sort of what we see in diabetics. Um, now, another condition we're gonna see that's very common is gonna be hypertension. This is more commonly known as just high blood pressure. And it's characterized as a condition in which an individual's blood pressure is 140 over 90 or greater, right? Um, so normal blood pressure is supposed to be 120 over 80. And then we consider a client to be uh, pre-hypertensive if, um, if their blood pressure is one, uh, 130 over 85 there. Um, that is gonna be uh, sort of in the middle, right? So um, for the record, there's real, I mean like pre-hypertension really isn't necessarily its own condition, um, but ideally we wanna have a client um, you know, with a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Anything uh, in between these two would be considered pre-hypertension. Uh, and we know that causes a lot of problems, right? Uh, pre-hypertension in particular I'm sorry, hypertension in particular, is very dangerous because it causes areas of high pressure and areas of low pressure in the body, which means you might not be able to deliver oxygen as effectively. And then if you can't deliver oxygen to a place like your brain, for instance, that can cause things such as stroke. So we definitely want to you know, manage our blood pressure levels. Uh, one of the best things you can do to manage that is actually going to be uh, peripheral heart action circuits, right? Those circuits where you alternate, starting with an upper body exercise and then go to a lower body exercise, up back to upper, back to lower, back to upper, back to lower. That's a really good thing for clients who have hypertension because that's evenly distributing blood flow throughout the body. Uh, now, coronary heart disease is another condition um, that is very, very common, commonly associated with obesity, um, but basically it's a disease of your coronary arteries, and those are the arteries that supply the heart uh, with its own blood, right? So uh, this typically results in the cells of your heart not getting enough oxygen, and so that can cause chest pain, which we refer to as angina. Um, this is, again, commonly associated with a lot of other conditions as well, um, including intermittent claudication or peripheral arterial disease, uh, which is uh, a very, very common 
um, a very common condition in which a client might have blockages in their arteries traveling down, particularly their legs or sometimes their arms. But basically, if you are not able to get blood down to those extremities, it gets really, really painful, right? Um, this is very, very similar to varicose veins, uh, which is where like, you know, like the veins actually get stretched out because blood's not making its way back to the heart. So it starts to pool in the legs. Um, with intermittent claudication, there are blockages in the arteries that supply the, the legs with enough oxygen. And so they can start to be very, very painful. Um, so that's definitely something to keep an eye out for as well. Um, Next condition we're going to talk about is osteoporosis. Uh, this is a condition characterized by a decrease in bone mass or a decrease in bone density. Um, and so your the your bones are made up of like this kind of honeycomb shape, you know, where they're very very dense, and that honeycomb shape allows them to kind of torque and flex and stuff. Um, but if those holes are too big, if the honeycomb has really thin walls and really large holes in it, um, obviously the bone's going to weigh much less, but it's also going to result in uh, much more fragile bones. Uh, there's also osteopenia, which is basically a, a precursor to osteoporosis, and this is where um, you have decrease the calcification of your bone mass, right? So you're basically not making as much bone tissue, which is what results in that decreased overall bone tissue later. Uh, another condition that is associated with the skeletal system is gonna be arthritis, right? Arthritis is going to be a condition uh, with compromised um, uh, dysfunction of your joints, right? So that's either going to be a decrease in cartilage um, which is like gonna happen over time because uh, maybe like your client has had like just a really high impact job uh, that has created like a lot of pressure on their joints. Um, that's gonna be known as like osteoarthritis, right? That's basically a degenerative joint disease that happens with age and just time and stress. You know, if you slowly build down those soft tissues which are designed to like buffer your bones, uh, that's gonna be your osteoarthritis. But there's also the autoimmune version, which is called rheumatoid arthritis. And that's actually where, unfortunately, your immune system actually starts thickening your own cartilage, leading to decreased space between your bones and sort of that knobby, bulging um, posture that we sometimes see in our joints. Um, so both of these are very serious. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little bit uh, different. That's basically general pain that somebody's going to experience almost every morning when they wake up. Um, obviously, there's a lot of like fluid changes that happen as we sleep um, because we're very sedentary for many hours at a time. And so when a client first wakes up in the morning, and they have rheumatoid arthritis, they might have like aches and pains. So you're probably gonna to wanna to schedule your exercise sessions later in the afternoon. Um, now we also talked a little bit about cancer, um, or at least, you know, uh, how to work with clients who are dealing with different types of cancers. Again, not something we can necessarily treat through exercise, but definitely something where we can improve somebody's quality of life while they are dealing with this condition. Um, so cancer is gonna be any of the various types of malignant neoplasms that invade surrounding tissues uh, and then metastasize. So they might start taking over those tissues leading to dysfunction in those tissues, right? Um, so um, that is like, there's obviously various different types of cancers out there, but the treatment for all of them lead to a lot of weakness and a lot of fatigue in the body. So we wanna make sure that we are taking that into account. Um, our clients may experience shortness of breath, they might experience, they might just feel very frail. Um, so heavy lifting is to be avoided. Um, you're trying to build up basically their endurance and their cardiorespiratory uh, capacity. Uh, similar to that, we also have chronic lung disease, uh, which is going to be broken up into two different categories. Uh, but basically, it's any and all conditions that decrease in ability, a person's ability to bring in and utilize oxygen. Um, so restrictive lung disease is where your lungs have actually become more fibrous, and so they might have a decreased ability to expand. Um, and then we also have things like obstructive lung disease, uh, which is where you actually have altered airflow getting into the lungs. This is more commonly referred to as COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. But basically that's a condition where there's excessive mucus or excessive tar or any other materials um, that are actually blocking your airways. So now oxygen can't travel um, and reach your blood vessels and then they can't get delivered around the body. Um, so. Uh, those are our kind of two most common versions there. Really the priority here is just to get somebody's uh, aerobic capacity built up um, and tolerance for exercise, right? Um, so a lot of time is gonna be spent 
you know, walking and increasing their aerobic capacity. Uh, now, one thing I kind of forgot to mention, so I had to kind of slap it on here at the end. I talked about it briefly, but we, we have our Borg scale, right? That's our exercise intensity. That's more commonly referred to as the RPE method or the ratings of perceived exertion scale. And basically that is a scale where, of six to 20, where you are gonna be, ask your client to rate how hard they feel they are working you know, during the activity. Um, so if they say they're like, oh my God, that was a 20, uh, and your client has obstructive lung disease, well, actually, probably they're not going to be able to tell you that it was a 20 because they're going to be so out of breath and you're working them very, very hard. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that, uh, in you know, depending on what condition you're working at, you're working at different intensities. Um, and that's about it, guys. Um, obviously, there are more specific, there are a lot more specific uh, notes that we have for each of these individual conditions, but you can review those on the tables in uh, chapter uh, 16 of your NASM, uh, as well as all of the notes that we have added throughout the rest of this course. Um, everybody, good luck on your final exam. If you have any questions, feel free to call or text me, uh, and we will uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow for the start of our senior program design class. All right, see you later, guys.